It's a naturally a dynamic system with a very complex flow regime or habitat complexity which different fish have adapted to live in different parts of that system. And they've done that over hundreds of thousands to millions of years and quite successfully. So they can tolerate a drought but they, they equally they know when to capitalise on a, on a flood and the, the resources that that might provide such as big lakes full of water like this. And then in the in-between you've got those transitions from a wet period to a dry period where things probably just tick over in neutral or first gear, waiting for the next big flood to push it on. People talk about a boom and bust. Yeah, it's a boom and bust. It's probably more like a boom and then a rest. There's quite a lot of work done recently to show that contrary to modern popular belief, the Darling did not stop flowing that often. And when it did, it usually wasn't for long. So not, not for years, usually for months. of research over the years where we've looked at the response from plankton, from algae, water plants, water bugs, fish in systems like this when they fill and it's phenomenal the amount of food that bursts out. So a fish like a golden perch that might spawn upstream, a couple of hundred thousand babies might result drifting downstream, 10,000, 20,000 might wind up in these lakes, plenty of food, really good survival. We call that floodplain recruitment because they're out on the floodplain and, and it's usually mass floodplain recruitment, big survival. And then in another two or three years, those fish will be moved back to the river, ideally. They'll be moving up and down the rivers themselves and then they'll do the same thing and keep the wheel spinning. But if we only do that every 10 years, we're in trouble because golden perch, they might live 10 to 15 years, sometimes a bit longer but they're getting past their prime around that 10 year mark. So we really need to have every year or two years or three years at most, we need to see that floodplain recruitment so a species like golden perch can remain abundant. The Menindee Lake system is a vast chain of ancient lakes containing over 10 interconnected bodies of water in the semi-arid country of far western New South Wales. In April 2020, the first flows in three years arrived in the Lower Darling Barker, filling two of the four major lakes, Lake Wetherall and Lake Pamamaroo. These, these lakes draw down or dry completely, and then when they fill up, it's a massive volume or a massive space of basically kindergarten for fish. It's a nursery habitat. driver, as with most rivers in Australia, is, is what we call a flood, or a flood, a flood pulse of productivity. The so sticks, the bark, the animal poo, all that sort of stuff in a flood, when that stuff gets inundated and those big dry cracked patches of, of dirt that people are used to seeing in a drought, when they get wet, they start to sort of crumble and dissolve into the water and a whole bunch of goodies and nutrients come out of that.
just wait, just wait, just all get to see, all right? I will, yeah. Everybody will get a look. I'll walk around and show you. That's a yabby. That's a shrimp, not a yabby. That's a shrimp. Righto. So you're going to tell me. Hang on, I'm going to walk through here and show you guys. That is called a gudgeon. In fact, it's called a carp gudgeon. It's not rated to carp, but the first the first guy who saw it thought it looked a bit like a carp and called it a carp gudgeon. Well, that's only that was only in there for 20 minutes, and we got one fish and one shrimp. That's pretty good. Give me that at least. Come on, round of applause for the fish, dude. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's pretty interesting. So, fish ecology is uh, learning more and more over the last few decades about what makes fish tick in the Murray-Darling Basin. One of the things we have seen is what I mentioned before, flood, mass floodplain recruitment, and it's in these lakes. And it's this, Menindee Lakes are the only places we've ever actually demonstrated it on multiple occasions. So we know what makes it happen, and it is a flood from the north comes through, fills up dry lakes or largely dry lakes, which are basically millions and millions of stock cubes. Once they go wet, they dissolve, the goodies come out, and you get this enormous, um, this boom of productivity, which is followed by food for baby fish, food for big fish, shrimp. They go nuts. That happens in here, and it happens in Menindee because we still get that variability. You might have a couple of dry years where the water trickles in, fills up the main weir pool. These, these lakes draw down or dry completely, and then when they fill up, it's a massive volume or a massive space of basically kindergarten for fish. And some of the research coming through recently suggests that the darling is contributing to the golden perch population in the Murray, really importantly, not just a little bit, really importantly, probably because of floodplain recruitment in these lakes here at Menindi. And that suggests something's not working quite right in the Murray. We know they, they breed there regularly, but that we don't get the mass recruitment. And it's probably going back a few steps because of that regulation. We don't have big lakes like this that wet up and dry down, wet up and dry down. Most of our big floodplain systems in the Murray are always wet, we've regulated them. That sort of turn what was hundreds and hundreds of kilometres of Murray River into weir pool after weir pool. After. So these are the pools that backed up behind a man-made weir, which is great for a town like Mildura, sits on a weir pool, water all year round. There's been a gradual increase in the way we regulate or control the river systems, and that starts with big headwater dams up at the top, um, but also with smaller weirs along river systems. The Murray's a very good example. It's highly regulated, lots of weirs. That leads to algal blooms. Your nutrients aren't getting recycled by a dry phase. It's just a lot more of a desert, even though it's wet, for something like native fish. So you don't get the flowing dynamics. You don't get all that stuff happening in weir pools. You might still get a wet decade or a wet few years and yellow belly come back, water birds breed, and people think, oh yeah, this system can cope, can recover. But over decades, you start to see this gradual one step forward, three steps back, one step forward, another three back. And that's kind of the, where we're starting to get the picture now that over sort of the last hundred years or so, we're really getting to that point where the volume of water and the variability are really not enough to sustain the diversity we want. And then on top of that, we have uh, changed changes in the way we, we manage the land adjacent to our water courses. So the runoff is of different nature now. You get more sediment running off rather than being captured and filtered by riparian vegetation. Um, feral animals in, in both on the land uh, exacerbate that, but in the water we have feral carp. Um, the way they feed is just by mumbling, filtering through mud. They make the water dirtier. They eat a lot of the plankton that was meant to be eaten by other things before it gets a chance to emerge and flourish. They rip plants up. They reduce light penetration so you get less plants on the bottom of the water. So they have a massive impact, both as an eco-engineer, but also in just consuming resources that other things would have done. And then there's uh, the habitat modification within the water itself. So uh, early idea was to make the, the rivers the highway of uh, the Murray-Darling Basin for river boats. And yet the water was variable. So river boats would get stuck on snags quite often. So. So we went about removing snags for a hundred years or so, um, pulling them out of the river so that the river boats could navigate better. 
many rock bars in the river, that natural variability structure I spoke about, they were blown up or ripped down again to facilitate better navigation by boats, which, which was important at the time because it was the only way things like wool or crops could be transported easily downstream. So we've lost the structure that helps create variability in the river and those structures also created homes for things like fish and snails and mussels. So you now have essentially a channel of water without the complexity underneath it. So if you've got to hide from predators like a Murray cod, there's fewer places to hide. If you nest because you're a Murray cod, there's fewer, fewer places to nest. Um, so all in all, all these bit by bit, these cumulative impacts have made living underwater a lot harder for things like fish. So that's a vast array of impacts that no one, no one deliberately set out to have an impact on the river system. But bit by bit, they add up. And yes, it's an adaptable system and Australian animals and plants are very adaptable by virtue of living on a, on a really dry continent. But at some stage, they're gonna run out of steam and they're gonna to fail to cope. And we're getting close to that point, in my opinion. We're getting close to some tipping points. We'll start seeing fish species go extinct in the next decade or so if we're not careful and on top of it. There's plenty to go around. You can share between two if you need them. We're gonna ask some questions first. See how good you guys are. Yep. What kind of fish? Hold on, you're correct. Hey? No? Anybody? I'll give you a clue. They get quite big. Yep. Murray cod. That's a Murray cod. They get to about a metre and a half long, which is probably longer than most of you guys. Uh, and they get to I'm lousy at chemistry, but I'm not bad at biology because it makes sense to me. So I try to help people understand some of those, join a few dots, understand those requirements that different things need. Usually it's quite simple. If, they, if you live on the edge of it, it makes sense. Um, but there's still, there's still quite a lot of um, me first mentality. You know, I don't want my patch to change at all. You can do whatever you want elsewhere, but not my patch. But the river and the basin is a big connected beast without connectivity, whether it's hydrological connectivity with the water or the flow variability to passes animals and plants up and down, uh, it'll slowly decay, disappear. So if you just think about your patch, you're gonna wind up with a, a green yard, but everything else will be dirty and dead. If you change things too much, rivers dry out completely and we run out of fish. This has happened twice in the last 10 years and it stayed dry for over 100 days the last one over 500 days now fish are tough in australia like everything they have to be tough because you get droughts and you get floods they cannot handle this time after time which is why fish are in big trouble and unfortunately most of us grown-ups have been alive while well, some of this has happened and we need you kids to fix it because it's your future we're going to give you a little heads up and a bit of a bit of help when you guys grow up, it's going to be up to you to help make sure this river comes back to life. Everybody take two steps back. I want you to, actually three of you can line up there. You and you. That's enough. There's more coming. Everybody imagine that this line is a timeline that stretches you. that way. You. This, is this today, line here. Right? That line is five meters from these guys. So this is a thousand years ago. This is 5,000 years ago. Hello, 2020. This is when the pyramids were built in Egypt. 5,000 years ago. I'm not gonna ask anyone to do it, but see that big gum tree down there? That's 40 meters away. 1,000, 5,000, 40,000. 40,000 years ago at that gum tree. That's when the original Bakinji people were around. Your ancestors built fish traps in this river to catch fish 20,000 years ago. Oldest human made structure on earth by a long shot. 5,000, 40,000. Now, this is where you've got your mind's going to go. <laughs> Murray Cod and Golden Perch, we spoke about started to survive in this river system about 30 million years ago. Now, one million years is a kilometre. 
30 kilometres that way. That's how long Murray Kind of Golden Perch have been hanging A couple of wet decades. Place. You build up and a community that, that gets used to it and accustomed to it. Um, but those decades only represent four or five fish generations. So that's a really rapid change from a system that's variable to a system that's not. Everybody wants their, their local environment to flourish and be beautiful and productive. Sometimes you've got to learn a few tidbits of information to join a few dots to realise, ah, if I want that, I'm going to have to accept a bit of variability. Not total, I don't want everything to go back to the way it was. That's never going to happen. But if, if you want your lake to flourish and offer fish nursery and habitat, it's going to have to draw down at some time so it can refill and those fish can come in. Uh, otherwise, we're just providing habitat for things from other parts of the world like carp that just love a stable water level. Sometimes people have to sort of stop, take a breath, join a few dots, talk to a few different types of people and get a different perspective and go, okay, it's not so bad. We can do this. What's your long-term dream, I guess, in terms of management of the, the system? It's a pretty simple dream. It's a, it's a sustainable balance between um, extraction when there's plenty of water and opportunistic use of water to grow stuff and, and drive agriculture. But when it's not wet, pull the foot off. So I think a, a lot more flexible approach to the way we manage water. Uh, put put the, the needs of the river first, so return that variability particularly those small to middle sized flow events that go up and down within channel or just over the top. We've got to try and get them in every year or two, particularly in the Darling. Uh, and then bigger floods every five or 10 years, hopefully they happen naturally. But we need places like this lake and the next one is dry, 16 kilometre wide lake that's dry. We need these fish factories functioning once or twice a decade at least. And that's the Darling. And to do that, you need to put the needs of the river it essentially comes down to an end of system flow target. This time of the year, you want this much flow through here and you want these wetlands wet or drying down. I'm trying to reinstate that natural flow regime, but not putting the brakes on so hard that we don't have a viable agricultural sector. Because um, that's after all why Australia is still prosperous in this realm. But I think we've probably gone a bit far one way. We're working to come back the other way. Things like the basin plan, and the Native Fish Management and Recovery Plan. They're measures that were, were derived and put on paper as a bit of a roadmap back towards that outcome. Uh, the problem at the moment is, is delivering on them as they were imagined. Um, obviously, everybody wants to get their bit first and someone else can take the pain. That's natural human behaviour. Um, and probably as a country as a whole, it's going to come down to what do people want to see. Uh, and I don't think people want to see um, mass fish kills or rivers drying up and turning to pools full of algae. Uh, even if you've never visited this part of the world, you only have to jump on Google Earth and have a look at it. Have a look at it 10 years ago, 20 years ago, to realise that these are, these are valuable pieces of, of Australia.